I originally had said that I was going to do the King James. We were going to discuss that. Uh, I'm going to postpone that, and I apologize. The reason for it is because, again, I was uh, I had a neck injury this past week that has left me... It's It's been difficult to get any work done. But because of that, I, I'm not quite as far along with the King James, because I'm doing a whole renovation on it, and I'm not far along with it as I would like to be. So because of this injury and that I, I can't really I can't tell exactly when I'm getting things done we're gonna we're gonna start another topic I wanted to save this one for later after the King James because there's gonna be some issues that we're gonna bring up about it but I think it'll be all right we'll just do this we're gonna talk about uh, the tribulation and rapture this is this is basically a beginner's guide to tribulation and rapture what do these things mean what does the Bible actually say about this now I grew up believing in pre-trib rapture. I've al always grew up believing that. Uh, that's what I was always taught. That's what the preachers always preached. I even, if you listen to some of my old seminars, I still make jokes about, you know, when I talk about the, the creation timeline showing the biblical model of history, and I talk about here we are today waiting for him to come back in about 20 minutes. You know, when I make that joke, that's something, you know, Kent Hovind used to make that joke, and I, I just carried it on because I thought it was funny. But I've stopped making that joke because I'm going to tell people, at least I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you what my position is directly on this so I don't sneak up on anybody, okay? I, today, take the position of post-trib. Now, uh, pre-trib and post-trib, pre-tribulation means there's going to be like this, this tribulation that's going to, you know, signify the end of the, it's the events of the end of the world, okay? The pre-trib folks believe that there's going to be a rapture. This is all the Christians are going to be taken out of the world. This is going to happen before tribulation hits. The post-trib people believe that all the Christians are going to be raptured out after tribulation hits. So that they will have to go through it. These are the differences between the two. A year and a half ago, I was pre-trib. Today, I am post-trib after because I spent about a year studying this topic for myself. I was getting frustrated and confused at all the different preachers I was listening to preach about it, and I said, you know what, I'm going to the Bible to find this one out myself. Because in Proverbs 15, 28, it says, The heart of the righteous studieth to answer, so we ought to study to answer these matters for ourselves. And that 1 John uh, two twenty seven says, The anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you. But the same anointing teacheth you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, as, and even it, as it has taught you, ye shall abide in him. Okay? So, you actually, none of you, need me to teach you this. Okay? You can go to the Bible, and you can understand these things for yourselves. And even though I, I'm going to do this teaching on this, I'm not saying it's wrong to listen to, to me teach on this. I'm saying you, it's not a necessity. And what I expect out of any of you is for you guys to go to the Bible, to look at the things I'm going to tell you, because this is going to be a multiple-part teaching. And we, we probably will be on this one for three or four weeks, I suspect. But you go to the Word of God in your own time, and you check out everything that I'm going to tell you here. I want you to verify it for yourself. Because I don't want you saying, hey, Chris Johnson teaches this, so therefore it's true. That is not how we come to a knowledge of the truth. You need to go to the Bible. It says the Bible says this, and therefore it's truth. Because if you say Chris Johnson says it, then you're putting me as your foundation, and I don't want to be your foundation, and you don't want me to be your foundation. You don't want to put your trust in me. I could lie to you. I'm just a, I'm a man in the flesh. You don't know. You need to go to the Word of God and trust in that first. And so I'd ask Christians to ask yourselves, have I ever studied this subject on my own? Very simple question, but not a question a lot of people like to ask or like to answer because most people would say, no, I haven't really studied this out on my own. And there are a number, number of people I have found just over the past few months that I've seen who have said, yeah, I started studying this issue on my own and I left the pre-trib and went the post-trib positions because they started studying the word themselves instead of listening to a preacher tell them what it says. Because in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith, and prove your own selves. Folks, you're going to go to the Word of God and study this. You don't have to study to try to justify what you believe to me or, or answer to me or anyone else here. I mean, you're going to answer to the Lord Jesus Christ in the end. So examine yourselves and what you believe and prove your own selves in that. Okay, um, We're supposed to be 
uh, study to show ourselves approved unto God. Okay? And try not to be intimidated by this topic either. That's one of the reasons a lot of people won't go to this. They get intimidated, and I'll tell you why there's so much confusion going on. Because by the end of this, what I'm going to show you guys is that the real confusion and the real intimidation is coming from false doctrines, false teachings that are floating around. If it weren't for the false teachings floating around, this is actually a very simple topic. And I'll show you step by step as we go through it. This topic is not difficult to understand, and we're going to go through it slowly at a snail's pace and try to uh, understand it as best we can. Now, like I said, I'm, I'm in a lot of pain right now. It may not even sound like it, but I am in constant pain. It doesn't stop. So I don't know that I'm going to go the full length of time. This one might be a little short, but I'm going to try in subsequent weeks, hopefully keep praying that I'll be healed as, as we try to, you know, um, work through the, what, I'm, what I'm trying to go through right now. But hopefully in, in subsequent weeks we'll, we'll be able to go farther. Now, one more time, don't take your pastor's word for it. Don't take your, your parents' word for it. Don't take you know, anybody else's word for it. Go to the scripture and gain your own understanding. That's the Christian work ethic. It's what we're supposed to do. Now, if you guys are following along on the website, if you want to, you can type in, just type in the word TRIB, T-R-I-B, you can type in a trib or a rapture or something like that into the search bar at creationliberty.com and pull up an article. It, it, you'll see it right there. It says Beginner's Guide to Tribulation and Rapture. Uh, or if you're listening by YouTube, you can just click on the link and it, in the description, and that will take you there. You can follow along. So this first image that we have here, this chart, is, is something I'm going to be building on. It's a what we know so far chart. Now, the, uh, what I put on here, the first thing I put, I put the tribulation, which you'll see at the bottom, and then we have pre-trib transport or post-trib transport. And the reason I left it right here, because if you guys will actually question the average person out there, this is about the extent of knowledge that they have. The average person has about, average, you know, churchgoer has about this much information on tribulation and rapture. And that's all they know. And they happen to believe, you know, one side or the other based on what their pastor told them. And guys, and, and that's common. Listen, if you, those of you who have been with us, because I think we've been doing this Bible study, what, like four or five years now? I think, I think actually it's been about five we've been doing this. Uh, the, and like, we, like I said, we've only been doing the recordings a little over a year, but we've been doing this, uh, this church group for about five years. And when we started, every single one of you who started from the beginning will remember that all of us, including myself, every one of us, have at one time said, well, doesn't the Bible say this? And when we found out, we searched it out later and found out, no, it doesn't say that. That was something we heard one of our pastors tell us. And so that, and that's happened frequently, that we have thought something was true based on what the pastor had told us. And when we went and searched it out, that wasn't, that wasn't the case. So it's happened to a lot of people. And so if it's happened to you guys out there, I mean, you don't have to feel embarrassed about that. It's happened to a lot of us, okay? We just need to make it right by doing what's right. So, um... This can get incredibly frustrating topic to study out because many of you will want to go to some teaching out there, just like you may be going to this teaching and listening to this. And one of the frustrating things you're going to find when you go out to a lot of different teachings, or at least you go to, you know, you go to your favorite mainstream ministry, whatever it is out there that you like listening to, and the frustrating thing is they're not going to answer the questions you have about it. They never seem to take a stand on it in most cases. I'm not saying in all cases. There are a number of ministries that do take a stand on it, but most of them don't. When you ask them, they're just like, oh, well, that's not really our concern, or, or you know, we don't, they don't want to answer it. They kind of beat around the bush on it. The reason they do this is because if they, every doctrine, they would come out and take a stand on that doctrine, they will lose their customer base. This is how it works, folks. If those of you who have never run a business before, you may not understand this, but you see, your customer base is all, is all based on how much they like your business and like your product. If you say something that would dare offend them or that they don't like, they will no longer purchase things from your business. That's why I said we have marketers, not ministers. Okay? We have peddlers, not pastors. These are, these are people that are, their God is in their belly. Just like it said in Isaiah, we were just reading in our first half today. Their God is in their belly. They're ready and willing to make merchandise of you. We've already quoted all the statistics before. In previous weeks in the false converts, I've talked about all these statistics where most of them said we're not even qualified to be here doing this. <laughs> so uh, they're more worried about their sales 
than they are about salvation. Okay, uh, They don't want the truth, they just want their money. Now, I believe the scriptures are very clear on this issue. So, now anything that I have in this, and I know this is a lot of disclaimer for me to say, but I really need to get all this out first thing. If the Bible says something, if I, because, guys, I am not a really fantastic speaker of any kind. Um, I'm not really charismatic, and I don't have all these great speeches I can make, and I fumble over my words a lot. But if I have something I have incorrect in here, the Bible's right and I'm wrong. Okay, if there's something the Bible says and I and I or I said it wrong or something, you might want to give me a little leeway on that because I'm not a, a fantastic speaker. But also, if I if I make any any error in Scripture, the Bible's right and I'm wrong. Okay, our job as Christians is to preach the gospel to all nations. We show them their guilt in the law, and that brings them to the foot of the cross and repentance and faith for to Jesus Christ. And then you baptize them in the name of the Holy Ghost and you teach them the doctrines of Christ, so that way they can go off and do the same thing. So whether there's pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, or any other flavor, it doesn't change the work we're supposed to be doing right now. And so um, I really believe that Christians are losing sight of what's in front of us, okay, directly right now and what we're supposed to be doing. However, that being said, I do believe this is a critical issue. Now, when I first started studying this, some of you have seen me say this before, that the this uh, tribulation rapture thing it's not really uh, an issue churches should be splitting over and you know Christians should be fighting over and all this. I have to say I disagree now. Uh, and the reason for that is because when we get down to the investigation of where this pre-trib doctrine came from, you're going to find out that it came out of a, a, the charismatic church, the New Age charismatic church, that was a branch of a Catholic church, and it came out of a 15-year-old false prophetess. Okay, a 15-year-old girl said she had a dream over this back in the uh, mid 1800s, and that is where the investigation stops for many researchers. When they go, when they look back into the history of pre-trib, when they follow it back to its origins, that's about where it stops right there. Mid 1800s is really where that got initiated. So this pre-trib doctrine has only been around for about the past 150 years. It's only been around about as long as Darwin, Dar uh, Darwinian's uh, theory of evolution, about as long as uh, Jehovah's false witnesses, about as long as Mormonism. Okay, a lot of these things all came in at the same time, and these are, uh, it, it's a uh, it, it's Catholic false prophecy that people are going after. So when somebody stands up in front of their church congregation, and preaches pre-trib, they're actually teaching false prophecy. That, in the Bible, is a very serious issue. Very serious. God takes that with, that with the utmost seriousness. Because you're basically, you're spreading a lie. So now I believe this is a critical issue. Now, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm trying to sell, tell Christians that you're losing sight of what's, what's right in front of you. But at the same time, I think it's a critical issue that Christians do. If, you know, a church split over that, I would completely understand it. Uh, because I, I do not want to be preaching anything out of the mouths of false prophets. And I don't understand why, you know, and what you're going to see, because we're just about to get started, but what you're going to see in some of the argumentation that people use, a lot of the pre-trib that I have listened to, when they give an argument for pre-trib, what they more or less do is not so much give biblical scripture, is they try to cast doubt. That seems to be the strategy. What they try to do is, is say, well, see, the Bible says this, well, that doesn't make sense, does it? So therefore, pre-trib pre is true. This is the kind of structure, and I'll show you examples in, in coming weeks of, of different people who are doing those kind of things, of, of how that works. And so what they're, they're not studying to answer, they're trying to cast doubt. All right, And that's how you have to do things. You have to cast doubt. This is how Satan was trying to do it, even with Jesus Christ. He's trying to cast doubt. That's how he did it with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He has to cast doubt on things. That's how you have to do it in order to get people to believe lies. All right? And so for the post-trib position, simply gives the scripture. And uh, I'll show you exactly what I mean. So where do we start on this whole thing? How do we begin to understand any of this, because when you sit down, and you're like, okay, I understand pre-tribulation -tri rapture. You're holding this huge Bible with, with, I mean, you've got over 1,200 chapters in this Bible. Where do you start? Well, for me, I'm, I was a layman and a simpleton. I, I still am, so I, I got to have help with this kind of thing. And I think the apostles were also laymen and simpletons in many areas. And um, even though there were some of them, like Paul, who were very smart, though he didn't come along until later. 
I think some of them were, were just simple fishermen, and they wanted to understand these things. So they asked Jesus Christ, and I thought that was a good place to start. They said, well, they were asking him. I'm I wonder the same thing, so let's read this. And he started in Matthew 24, starting in verse 3. It says, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privily, saying, or excuse me, privily, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of the coming and of the end of the world? Then in verse 4, and by the way, the, the subsequent chapters you can get in the, other, in the New Testament, or at least the, the first four books of the Gospels, is Mark 13 and Luke 21, is where these are located. So you can read all those. In Matthew 24, 4, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now the first thing Jesus Christ says to answer their question, What will be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world? He tells them, Don't be deceived. Which means, there would have to be a lot of deception going on for him to tell us that. If that's the first thing he <laughs> first remark he makes after that. But he continues and says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. Now, I've heard of this quite a bit, actually. There was one guy I just, oh, I can't remember. Uh, did somebody share it on their Facebook group or something like that? I can't remember. The guy that was, uh, I, I, th I don't know if he was Mexican or, or, or maybe from Venezuela. I can't remember who, where he was. Uh, maybe South America, I don't know. But he, he was some sort of uh, political leader who claimed to be Jesus Christ. There's a number of people, you should look it up sometime, there are, Quite a number of people that claim to be Jesus Christ in the flesh. Well, they're all over the place, okay? Uh, but you got to remember the final Antichrist. Now, every single one of them are Antichrist, sure. But the final one, the final one, is going to do something very specific that we're going to discuss in this article uh, later. So it says, They'll come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear uh, wars... Uh, hear, uh, ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So it is my suspicion, based on these descriptions, that we're in the beginning of sorrows now. Uh, we have nation rising against nation all the time. We have kingdom against kingdom, even though that's going to get a lot worse, a lot worse, okay? Because we've got to get this, I mean, this whole thing is going to come down to just a handful of nations before the end of this, okay? Um, or maybe not a handful of nations, but a handful of kings that are going to be ruling over these nations. There could be, see, a lot of people think that, uh, you know, there's only going to be a number of nations. Well, uh, I'm not, the Bible doesn't say that. It, the, the heads of the beasts that are being talked about, we'll get to that later, but the heads of the beasts that are being talked about are kings. It doesn't, doesn't mean there's necessarily one nation for that king. There could be multiple nations that, that king is ruling over, so we don't know for 100% certain. Uh, and I think there's a lot of assumptions people are making by that, and, and really when it comes to future prophecy, things that have not been fulfilled yet, I don't like to assume anything. Because I bet when, when prophecies were first given by Daniel, there was a lot of assumptions that were made over a lot of different things. Because he foretold a number of kingdoms, world kingdoms that would come forward. I bet there were all sorts of assumptions that were made. And people were surprised when they found out what was happening. But as we know history now, we know that those prophecies came out and were fulfilled to the letter. And so there's a lot of things that we have, I mean, I don't want to get people into presuming something to be true and therefore carrying that doctrine on and teaching other people they need to teach that. Be careful about that stuff, okay? And I'm going to try to be very careful in this. If there's something I don't particularly know, I'm going to tell you I don't know, all right? If there's something the Bible is, it doesn't say that it's 100% clear about what that is, I'm not going to say that that's, I'm going to let you know this isn't 100% clear, Okay? Um, now, there might be some people who out there who have answers to some of that stuff, and somebody will write me and say, well, Chris, here's the answer to this and this. Okay, that's wonderful, okay? Until I can verify certain things in the Bible, I'm not adding anything to this, okay? I want to be able to verify it for myself. Anyway, so, and there's going to be all sorts of people that are going to write me trying to justify their pet theories. Look, I don't care about your pet theories. <laughs> I, they said, well, you, uh, hey, you should believe this and this and this, you know? Because I, I believe that, therefore you believe it, and you ought to write about this too. I have people do that kind of thing to me all the time, okay? Your pet theories are irrelevant to me. I care about what the Word of God says, all right? Anyway, so we've got this beginning of sorrows. This is why I added this onto the chart. You've got a beginning of sorrows, and then will come the tribulation after there, after that. So continuing on in Matthew 24, we'll start in verse 9. 
It says, Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. Now wait a second, you've got the beginning of sorrows, and it says you're going to be delivered up to be afflicted and killed. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and they shall betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall arise, and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he then shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Now when it says, the same shall be saved, there's a lot of people that say, Aha, see, you have to endure, you have to do works to get salvation. No, thus for the people who are already saved. This is a promise of God, a reminder of hope to them. He says, even though you're going to suffer through these times, he says, just keep enduring because you're going to be saved. It's okay, just endure through it. And continue, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the world as a witness. We are going to be serving as a witness to the gospel through that persecution, and the signs of the times will be a witness to all these nations. And then the end shall come, because God's given everybody a fair shot here, okay, to, to repent and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember that Jesus Christ, the question he was asked was, what will be the sign of thy coming? Here was his answer, what we just read so far. The beginning of sorrows, and then we would be delivered up to torture, murder, and hatred for the, for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ. Now, as I was reading through Matthew 24, as a person who was reading through this, believing in pre-trib, there was a red flag that went up for me when I was reading this. And because here it's saying that one of the signs of Jesus Christ returning is when Christians will be hated and killed by all nations, which is a very clear sign of tribulation. Why is it that they think they're going to be out of here before tribulation, but Jesus Christ said, I'm not coming until you guys are, are, have tribulation? Um... <laughs> <laughs> that seemed to be a contra contradiction to me. Now, at this point, i got to warn you guys about some false teachings you're going to hear. Now, one of the, the I, I think the first place I heard this was from Sam Gipp. Now, Sam Gipp, Dr. Samuel Gipp, that's the one I'm talking about, he is the same one that does all the teachings on the King James. I think Sam Gipp's teachings on the King James are top-notch. I mean, I would consider him one of the best educators on the King James Bible that there is. However... Sam Gipp teaches a number of false doctrines. Uh, I've listened to many of his sermons, because I liked his King James stuff so much, I went to listen to a bunch of his sermons. He teaches a number of false doctrines, guys. Uh, you need to be careful about, what's, about what Sam Gipp is teaching. I think the man is a born-again, saved Christian. I think he truly, sincerely does uh, love the Lord and has a love for the truth. And I've never met him. I'm sure he's a very friendly guy. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't matter how friendly you are, it doesn't matter how much you love the Lord Jesus Christ, it matters, are you teaching the truth, okay? <laughs> it doesn't matter what he claims about it. And if you listen to Sam, like, you know, just take for, I'll give you one example. He teaches um, the false teachings on tithe. He teaches people that they need to be tithing and tithing in there every single week and all that. He teaches that same junk that all the other mainstream preachers teach, okay? But I think Sam Gipp, he was taught that, and so that's what he's always done. But again, that's how he also, they get a lot of funding. Now, he's done a lot of ev evangelism. I mean, they've lived out of what they hadn't, I can't remember, they went like 20 years without a home. He was just driving around in an RV, and, and they relied on people being charitable. So I can understand him wanting people to tithe because they get more charitable donations. But again, that's not, you know, teaching false doctrine to get more money. That's, that's not the way to go. And, and Sam Gipp, you listen to him long enough, you'll get the impression it's Sam Gipp's way or the highway. Um, that's the way he preaches this. Um, you'll, you'll see it. If you ever sit down and listen to him, I'm not saying it's bad to listen to him. There are some things that he teaches that are correct, and some things he teaches that are very interesting, and his King James teachings are, are fantastic, but just beware the rest of it, okay? Now, there's other people that also teach what I'm about to talk about here, but Sam Gipp, uh, I listened to him teach that Matthew 24 is only talking to the Jews. Everything that we just read, I just read it in Matthew 24, he says that's just for the Jews, that's not for Christians. This is ludicrous, okay? I have heard, if I remember correctly, now Dave Hunt died, what, like a year or two ago? I can't remember when he died. But Dave Hunt, who wrote uh, a lot of great material, he has wonderful material, tons of it, really good stuff. But he believes in this pre-trib false prophecy. And Dave Hunt taught the same thing, Matthew 24. There was some lady on her Facebook group that uh, sent us a guy by the name of Jeffrey Greider, 
who preaches, and he teaches this same thing. Uh, there's, I'm, I'm just pointing out some names here. There's tons of people that teach this. And I'm going to show you very carefully. Let's go back to Matthew 24. And here, uh, let's see here. This is, this is starting in verse 9. It says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Are the Jews suffering? Yes. Are they hated? Yes. Are they suffering and are hated because of Jesus Christ? Are they suffering for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ? No. There's only one group who is suffering for the name of Jesus Christ, and that's the born-again Christians. They are suffering for, the, for, for Jesus Christ's name's sake. So this can't be talking about the Jews. Even if they want to say, okay, we're going to, because what they try to say, we're going to be out of here, we're going to be raptured out, and then this tribulation is going to happen, and that's just, the tribulation is all for the Jews. Wait a second, the Jews are going to accept, when we get to the abomination of desolation, they're going to accept a false Messiah. They're going to accept the Antichrist. They are not suffering for the sake, name's sake of Jesus Christ. They don't believe in him. Okay, only the Christians are doing that. Now, the, the whole uh, chapter of Matthew 24, and we're going to quote this in later teachings, okay? I'm not going to get in too much into it right now. In later teachings, we're going to see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you will sit down with your Bibles and read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 very slowly, you're going to find out that Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus were all teaching the same exact doctrine in Matthew 24 to the church of Thessalonica. Why would they give the same teaching to Thessalonica, to the Christians in Thessalonica, if that wasn't meant for the Christians. That doesn't make any sense. The reason for this is because, yes, it is meant specifically for the Christian church. That is the very simple answer. But many of these questions are unanswerable by people who have this pre-trib pet theory because many of them, it's, it's a presupposition. They, are, they believe in pre-trib before they ever approach the Bible to find out what the Bible says and the Bible defines about it. Now, I had a guy by the name of Aaron, he wrote me after this article was published, and I, I went ahead and added this in to show people some, some things. He said, quote, Hello, Chris. I'm writing in response to your tribulation article. Matthew 24 is directed at Jews only because there were no Christians at that point. Christ had not died and rose again yet, so how could he be talking to us? End quote. Well, first of all, Aaron is ignoring Jesus Christ in Matthew 24 when he says he is referring to those that would suffer for his name's sake. Well, who else is he referring to then? If Aaron doesn't want to believe that this is talking to the Christians, then who else is suffering for the na name of Jesus Christ? There is no other answer to that, okay? So he's, he ignores that and just keeps posing questions. Again, this is what the Bible calls ministering questions, casting doubt. That's what this whole thing is. Uh, that's why they have to, I, like I told you, this is another example of one of those things when the pre-trib people come along, you will find that they will pose rapid-fire questions. It's actually called a many-questions fallacy. They rapid-fire questions to make it seem like that you can't answer all these questions or that there are no answers to them. That's not a way to answer questions. That ministers questions. That's not what the Bible tells us we're supposed to do. But also, as... I mean, in Acts 11, Acts 11 is the first place, the first time they're called Christians. They're called Christians first in Antioch, okay? But they are also, we are also known by another name. It's called the elect. Now, there are many, many preachers out there, I have heard say, and I used to believe this too, okay? I've heard them say that the elect in the Bible is only referring to the Jews. This is, this is ludicrous. That's not possible. I'll show you. I'll give you a number of examples. I'll just give you a handful of them. I think there's more than this. From I, I was just going over a number of them when I was looking this up, uh, you know, a few weeks ago or a few months ago when I was writing, when doing the update on this. In Romans chapter eight, starting in verse thirty-two, it said that he spared not his own son. This is talking about Jesus Christ. Okay, God spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's saying, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. When it says God's elect, who's he, who's he referring to? Those for which he spared not his own son. It says, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ 
that died, yea, rather, that, that is risen again, who is at, even at the right hand of God, who also make intercession for us. And they said, oh, no, it's just talking about Jesus Christ is the one that uh, condemns the Jews. No, no, no. He says, who also make intercession for us. Us. That's first person plural, meaning that it's all of us, the born again saved Christians. That's who Paul's writing about. It was called God's elect. Colossians chapter 3. It says, put on, and this is starting in verse 12, by the way. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. Now, of course, this is, this is written to the church in Colossia, right? And that's, this is talk, talking to them and calling them the elect of God. It says, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And it, said, it references to, them, to the Christians here as the elect of God. Here's another one from Titus 1.1. It says, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the faith of God's elect. Who has faith in Jesus Christ? God's elect. Who has faith in Jesus Christ? Christians. This is not a difficult concept. Here's one more. 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, 1 through 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout uh, Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bith Bithynia. Now, strangers scattered, strangers scattered throughout these places. These are all the Christians he's talking about that are scattered throughout all these places across the world. He says, and he calls them, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit. That's those who have received the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. He's addressing Christians and called them the elect. Folks, if you hear a preacher say that the elect, now the elect can refer to Jews, and it does many times, but to say that it only refers to Jews is incorrect. The elect are those who are justified by, who have the righteousness of God. They are justified by faith. Okay, those who have come in repentance to God justified by faith, whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament through Jesus Christ. All right, so when they want to say that Matthew 24 I mean, because here, and then going back to my point, where he says, Matthew, he says, there were no Christians at that point. Yes, there were. You're trying to tell me that when Jesus Christ died, he rose from the dead, he's at the right hand of the Father. From that point, clear through Acts 11, there were no Christians? <laughs> okay, this is the preposterous argumentation they've got to give in order to back this up. But you see, they were only referred to as the elect. They were first called Christians in Antioch. And Christian means Christ-like. To be like Christ, okay? And to try to follow after his teachings and his doctrines. So, yes, there are Christians, but they weren't so named until that point. All right? Just because the name wasn't there doesn't mean they didn't exist. So, uh, and the Bible tells us, uh, we have these... Um, we, we read these, and we have like a paragraph markers in some of your King James Bibles when you're reading those. And the at the, at the end of uh, verse 14 in Matthew 24, that's the end of the paragraph. And there's a paragraph marker that shows us that Christ now is going back to give an overview more to answer their question in more detail. And he begins by saying in verse 15, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by, by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. So, this is an important part of this, okay? He says, whoso readeth, let him understand. That means many people, you're going to be able to understand this if you'll read it, okay, and understand. But we need to go back to the book of Daniel and find out exactly what he's referring to here before we can continue. Now, I think I'm, I'm feeling still enough, okay enough to keep going, so we're going to keep going through one more section here. So, we've got the abomination of desolation. Now, it says he confirmed... He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. This is in Daniel 9.27. This is what it's talking about this. And for the overspreading of the abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Okay, now the he in Daniel 9.27 is the final Antichrist. That's the son of perdition that's talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. 
and we'll read those verses. Again, we're going to cover those in later teachings on this, on this issue. We'll talk about those. But it's going to cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Now, the sacrifices and the oblations were done by the Jews in the temple. This is where they gave sacrifice and, and gave, made sacrifices and gave oblations. Okay? Now, Jesus Christ, once he died on the cross, once and for all, just like I talked about earlier, he, he voided all further sacrifices. Because God is not, just like we read in Isaiah chapter 1, God is not, he, he doesn't like blood. He hates that, the, you know, all these animals and things are being, having to be killed for this purpose. He doesn't like that. It's a, that's not something that appeases him. He hates that stuff. He despises it. So he comes down, sacrifices himself, uh, sacrifices his son, his son, to die on the cross for once and for all to save us all from our sins. And again, this is what I was talking about earlier, that, you know, the Catholic Church, they have this transubstantiation, which is a total abomination unto God. It's wickedness in every sense. And they believe that this wine that they have, this fermentation, there's a long reference, we've talked about that before, about the connection between fermentation and leaven and all that. But they believe that they're turning this wine into the literal blood of Jesus Christ, but under the appearance that it's still wine, and they're supposed to drink that. Now, they're drinking it, and you're, first of all, you're not supposed to drink blood, okay? <laughs> this is something that's not supposed to happen, but that, you see, what that's doing is trying to repeat the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If you're repeating the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then you're denying him, because he said it is finished. Once and for all, it's done. If you don't believe, if you don't believe him in that, then you don't really believe him. The Jesus Christ Catholics are referring to are a false idol that they have made up in their minds, but it's not the Christian God of the Bible. Hebrews 10:10 10, 10 says, "By which we are, which, by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all." Hebrews 7:27, "Who needeth not daily as those high priests, like the high priests of the Catholic Church, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's? For this he did once when he offered up himself." So there's only one place that sacrifices and oblations were made by the Jews, and again, that's in the temple. In, in Exodus 29, uh, 28, uh, it says, And it shall be Aaron's and his sons and his sons by a statute forever from the children of Israel, for it is a heave offering, and it shall be a heave offering from the children of Israel of the sacrifice of their peace offerings, even their heave offering unto the Lord. And in Leviticus chapter 2, it says, If thou bring an oblation of a meat offering, bacon, uh, bacon in the oven, it shall be uh, unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with oil, or unleavened wafers anointed with oil. So these, the, I was giving you, the reason I posted the here is because I, or, or I quoted those in the article is to show you the sacrifices and oblations. All these were being done in the temple. This is where they would bring them. So that means this abomination of desolation. The Jews will have to have rebuilt Solomon's temple begin the sacrifices and oblations once again, which is an abomination unto God. That's why they call it the abomination of desolation. And it says, when the final Antichrist, now this is going back to uh, Daniel chapter 9, it says that he's going to stand in the, in the midst of the week, he's going, to, he's going to cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So he's going to stand in the temple, claiming himself to be the Messiah that is supposed to be the propitiation of all their sins. That's what he's going to that's what he's going to do. Now because that's the only reason they would stop the sacrifices and the oblations is if there was somebody who is representing this Messiah that they were that that Jews because they don't believe in Jesus Christ, they're still looking for. They're looking for some other Messiah to come along. This is why they're going to be fooled by this man. Okay? Because they, they have the, in their minds there is no way they would ever kill their own Messiah. There's no way they would ever kill God. But that's exactly what they did. And it's exactly what all of us do. It's, the Bible tells us we, sacrifice, we, we uh, crucify him daily okay? through, through the wickedness of the things that we do. Now, this is something that they just they, they do not want to believe ever that they would do that. So they'll make excuses, they'll write things off. And then they're also going to be fooled by the final Antichrist. And when I, when I say the final Antichrist, I also want to make mention, in case uh, those of you aren't aware, in 1 John 2.18, it says, Little children, is the last time, and as ye have heard, the Antichrist shall come. 
even now there are many antichrists, whereby we know is the last time. So, antichrist is someone that is completely against Christ, or trying to take the place of Christ, things like that. And he says there are many, even now, when John was writing that, there were many. Today, there are many. The, po the current pope is an antichrist, but he is not the final antichrist. Okay? The final Antichrist is going to be different. The final Antichrist, you will know him when he stands in the temple and he starts making these speeches. He gets the Jews to stop their, their sacrifices and oblations, of course. But we're first going to have to have a temple rebuilt. And the only place they will build that temple is on Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And there's a problem with that. And I'll get to that in just a second here, I guess, because I wanted to make sure um, that Second Thessalonians, uh, Second Thessalonians 2 3, when I mentioned it earlier, I said we quote it. I said, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So the, f the finale of this whole thing is not going to come until there is, an anti there is a final antichrist to stand in that temple of Solomon and stop the ablations. I just want to make mention of that. Now, no one is really sure how this temple is going to get constructed. And there's a number of theories how it might get accomplished, but, but one thing we do know, it's got to be on, on Temple Mount. That's the only place that the Jews will do that. But the Muslims currently have a building there that they worship in, right in that spot, uh, where it's called Al-Aqsa Mosque. And I've got pictures of it on the website you can see there. Okay, now the Muslims are extremely sensitive about this mosque. And there's even, I mean, even, Spar I, I've read news articles and I've got references, the references on the website where you can see some of these news articles where there have been suicide bombings and threats of war over, just over rumors of them taking this building down. Even just the rumor itself that they would tear down this building is, is causing, you know, uprisings of suicide bombers. There, there no even verifiable facts on a rumor. In fact, some of the rumors that they talked about, they said they weren't even true, but, you know, there were threats of war and suicide. I mean, because that's, that's how uh, the Muslim religion is. And I'm wondering if, if maybe I should have started on Muslim, the Muslim religion first, to get a real good understanding of that But uh, before I ever did this. But I really I felt like we could cover this one now. It was a good time for it. But we will cover the Muslim religion later, because that is, like I said, it is one of the goofiest religions you will ever hear of. I mean, it, people we, I mean, people take it with the utmost seriousness because of all the suicide bombings, but once you understand the foundations of it and what it actually is, it is one of the goofiest, silliest religions I have ever heard of in my life. And you'll, you'll see what I'm talking about uh, as we, when we cover that later. But on the other hand, there's Muslims who have written open published opinions that they would like to see Solomon's temple rebuilt and would invite them to, to build it together in peace. Here's a quotation from an article from, uh, in the Jewish press from a, from a Muslim. This is a Muslim author called uh, A New Muslim Vision, Rebuilding Solomon's Temple Together. It says, quote, As a devout Muslim, it would be a joy for me to see Prophet Solomon's temple rebuilt as well. No, you did not hear me wrong. Prophet Solomon's temple being rebuilt in all its magnificence and glory would be a great delight for me, as it would be to any Muslim. When he says that, that's not true, as it would be to any Muslim. That's ridiculous. He's serving up propaganda there, but he believes that, and I'm, I'm sure there are some out there that do believe that, like, like he does. He continues and says, Under different circumstances, in an atmosphere of trust, love, and brotherhood, Muslims would, would welcome this with enthusiasm. Actually, it is everyone's aspiration for that city to be adorned, to be beautiful, to regain the magnificent glory it had in the days of the Prophet Solomon, end quote. So as you see here, there are, other, there are some that say, okay, well... Yeah, we could just tear down this mosque and then we could rebuild Solomon's temple there. They think that would be acceptable. Others of them that says, we're going to go to war with you if you touch that, that building. So how exactly is this going to play out? Well, there's another theory I heard of. Now, th the next image that you see on here, if you will click on that image, if any of your computers, you can do that right now, it's going to pop up a window. It'll take you to Google Maps. And that'll show you an interactive image that you can actually, you can move it around and you can look at that whole area. To the left, because the picture I have in there is Al-Aqsa Mosque. And if you look to the left of that, there's an open area there. It's, it's kind of vacant. It has a few like tiny buildings there, but it's completely vacant. Uh, you could fit Solomon's Temple, that's the north end there. You could fit Solomon's Temple in that north end and put it right there next to it. 
I don't know if that's what's going to happen or not, but um, we'll see. We don't know. Now, will we know when this happens is another another note I wanted to make. Because I heard, I heard somebody teaching on this one time that says, well, it's likely that when the abomination of desolation happens, this is just going to be a secretive event. It's not going to be very well known. It's not going to be publicized anywhere. I, I, I disagree. I disagree strongly. I think this is going to be a big thing. Because, again, there's so much war and so much strife in the Middle East. When the, when the final Antichrist comes, I mean, it's, it's going to be like all eyes on him. When the Jews recognize him as Messiah, and you think that's not going to be publicized on the news? <laughs> that's going to be a huge event. Okay, and, and besides the fact that uh, Jesus Christ had said, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation well, then it's something that we're going to know about. It's not something that's going to be secretive. It's something that's going to be out there and people will know about. So it's an event that you'll witness. But continuing, so I, I just when people, I just want to mention, when people say that, I don't believe them because when the Bible says you're going to see it, well, then I think that's something that's going to be publica publicized worldwide. And in Matthew 24, starting in verse 15 again, it says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by, by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since, as was not since the beginning of the world, nor uh, no nor ever shall be okay now uh, i got to mention this too i had one guy write me he says there is no such thing he says uh, he says you're teaching this on your website there is no such thing called uh, like in capital letters the great tribulation and i wrote him back and i said where on my website did you find me quoting the great tribulation and saying that this was an event that would take place and it's called this i never said that he just said there's going to be great tribulation. So there's going to be a period of tribulation that was greater than any other time. But you see, again, that's one of the things that I see a lot of these pre-trib folks do. They don't come with a biblical discussion. What they do is they try to cast doubt. And then they'll end up lying and saying, you said this when I, I never said that. Never once did I put that on here. I just said there's going to be tribulation. And so there's going to be a period of time of tribulation. Now, we're going to get into where Daniel, it, you'll notice that it says that there's going to be a week in which this happens, okay? Uh, back in the book of Daniel, it said that. We're going to discuss uh, later on what exactly that means uh, concerning prophecy. But all we know so far is that there's going to be an abomin abomination of desolation. We haven't read far enough into this to see when exactly that abomination of desolation is going to happen. But we're, we are, Jesus Christ is going to give us more details and the book of Daniel is going to give us more details. We're going to see when these things are. And we're going to show more scriptures that are going to reveal this step by step to add on to this chart. But I think that's where we're going to stop here. Mostly because I'm, I'm in some pain. I really don't want to go too much farther. So, did anybody have any questions or comments that you guys want to make before we end? Well, thanks for joining us this week. May our Lord Jesus Christ bless you all as you study his word. And we'll see you next week.